Good morning, everybody. It's Coach Brian here from Without Limits Coaching and Twisted Ankle Production. Um, I'm going to make a quick race recap of the Umstead 100 race that I did Saturday, uh, last Saturday. It was April 1st, 2017, and um, it was my first 100-mile race. Uh, I am not a blogger, or a, I don't really enjoy at all typing out long race reports. So um, this is my version of doing that, a vlog. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, I'm going to break this down into three elements uh, for the race report. One's going to be course, uh, des description of the course, just kind of what it was, um, talk about it. Uh, in detail a little bit, uh, somewhat detail. Uh, two is going to be nutrition, what I did on the course, um, my plan, um, how I executed it, um, and kind of what was at the aid stations and how that worked for me. And then that would lead me into three, the execution of the whole race. So how I did each lap, um, which will be described in kind of what the course was. So uh, and how I played it all out and how the day went. So we'll get right into it. First, I'm going to talk about the course. Um, the Umstead 100 is a eight loop, 12 and a half mile course. So you do eight loops of a 12 and a half mile route. Um, it is no single track. There's a section that's a little kind of rocky coming in and out of the transition area. Um, but the most of it is bridle trails, packed gravel. It's, it's not a technical trail at all, it's, um, but it's not road. So it is considered a trail. Um, uh, I'm from the Wilmington, North Carolina area, so I'm about two and a half mile hours away from where the trail was. So I got to go up, I think, twice and run, um, one being two weeks out, um, just to actually run the actual course and get a preview of where we're starting, where we're finishing, and all that. So a uh, description of the course. As I said, I only need to tell you once because it's eight loops. Um, the course comes, there's a like a, an area where we meet. It's got a cabins and a kind of a home, board, home base headquarters big building that's used for like Boy Scouts and stuff like that. Uh, different retreats, um, very primitive, which is fine. Um, they had the pasta dinner there as well. Um, they did the pre-race meeting there. Um, plenty of room, nice big uh, meeting area. Um, leading out of the um, the first loop, you go out like a gravel road with the, everybody um, and you kind of wind down a gravel road for about a, that's a half a mile until you hit the main trail, uh, which is if you're not familiar with the uh, Umstead course or Raleigh area, um, it's it's basically a bridal trail, wide, probably a two-lane wide um, road that's really fine gravel, um, and it's you know up and down. Uh, it's about a thousand feet of climbing each lap, so each loop you do you do a thousand feet of climbing, um, uh, elevation gain. Uh, the first section you run out to the bridle trail, you're about a half a mile in and you turn right onto this out and back section, which is about three miles. It's about an out, out, about a mile and a half out and a mile and a half back. Um, that section is fairly flat. Uh, there's a little incline going out um, and a little incline coming back, um, but it's, it's not bad. It's not a bad section um, other than it being a boring after you do it several, <laughs> several times. Um, that would probably be my least favorite section, and it seemed to be any time I had a little, little bit of a lull in my spirit, it was on that section, and I don't know if it was just because it was boring or what, but um, you did get to see people going out and back, so that was kind of nice, but as far as course goes, um, that uh, was my least favorite section. Uh, then you started on a section that was still really big bridle um, wide trail, which actually the majority of it was, and um, you kind of up and down um, slight rolling hills, uh, nothing really bad, um, and you're at about mile four, and you start down a uh, really long down section. Uh, I want to say it's about a mile down, um, and you come up near like where the Reedy Creek um, uh, Lake is for that entrance of the park, and then you got about a mile uphill, and it's not a steep uphill; it's just a really long grind, and um, I would walk that section most of the time. Um, but uh, that goes up, and then you kind of come up to where Turkey Creek Trail is, and you turn, take a left, and that actually gets more narrow. Um, it's not as wide. It's still, for the most part, uh, that really fine gravel, um, very very runnable stuff, uh, not technical. But it just the trail narrows, and that back section from like miles six to uh, ten, 
um, were a little more challenging. That would be the section I would consider where it's, you know, you're walking a lot more. There's a lot more up, like steep uphills. I think there was four kind of nasty uphill, downhill um, sections on there where it's actually, you know, hands on knees climbing up in certain sections. Um, if you're just going out to do a run of that loop, it's not bad. You can run it. But if you're doing eight loops of it and you got 100 miles out there, um, you know, those those are big hills and you have to take, you have to be cautious about them. So that's the whole back section. There's a really big aid station around miles, almost at mile seven. Um, I mean, and, and I'll get into the aid stations, but that was where the big aid station was. You grind out of that, you come all the way up to a section um, coming up a hill where it's, you hit a Graylin trail. You turn left onto the Graylin trail and that's a really long, slow downhill. Uh, I want to say about a mile and a half. And uh, that was the worst part of the trail for me. Uh, as far as physically later in the race, um, the, my quads, I live in about as flat an area as you can get and uh, that really hurt. But anyway, as far as this trail part of it goes, the course section I'm talking about now goes for about a mile and a half downhill and then you have a pretty steep, quick uphill out of that. And then you're back on the main bridal trail that uh, where the out and back section was. You run about a mile down that, heading back to the uh, transition area, home base headquarters, whatever you want to call it. Um, you, when you are at about mile 12, you turn right and you go about a half a mile back down to where the home base was. Um, and then you gave him your number, told him that you finished your lap and you were heading back out. That's pretty much it. He did like a little lollipop thing around so they could see your number. Um, you could get your time and, and then you headed back out. So that's the course. As I said, 12 and a half mile loops, not technical, hilly for a flatlander, um, but uh, uh, very, very runnable course. Um, and, and enjoyable for the most part. We had great weather, so um, it was sunny. I think it got up to the upper 70s, so uh, nothing too bad. I like the heat. Um, I just do okay in heat, so um, it being a little warm was great for me. Um, I enjoyed it. I ran in a short sleeve shirt and shorts the entire race. No, I'm sorry. The first lap I didn't because it was a little chilly in the morning. Second lap, I got rid of my long sleeve shirt, and, um, and I ran the rest of it even all through the night. Um, uh, in, um, in a short sleeve shirt and shorts. Um, so that, that's being said. Okay, so let's move on to topic number two, um, nutrition. So my plan was, and this is, you know, best laid plans. My plan was to carry Tailwind um, in a handheld um, and to um, do water at the aid stations and carry uh, either a bar and two gels or a um, waffle I, not those Hunter Stingers, but actually the, these things called, um, they're Belgian waffles from uh, Costco. They're about like this big, and um, they're kind of a thick Belgian waffle. They're um, about, the bars and the waffle were somewhere around 300 calories a piece, and then I carry two gels with me, which are 100 piece, and I like the V-Fuel gels, so that's what I use. Um, and then Tailwind. So that gave me somewhere in the, with me, um, whether I use it or not, somewhere in the 700 calorie range, leaving out of transition um, or headquarters each time, and uh, and it was all sweet. So that was my plan was to do all for me to carry all sweet stuff and then utilize the use station, the aid stations for salty, um, savory type stuff. Um, so that's what I did. Uh, each aid, uh, I found though that I was starting to get dehydrated by only carrying. By carrying Tailwind and only drinking water at the aid stations, and it did get a little warm. So what I did is after about the second loop, I just got I stopped using the Tailwind, and I just went to water in my handheld. I did actually carry the handheld the entire time, uh, which after 22 and a half hours uh, became pretty heavy. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it would, but it did. So, um, But I carried it the whole time, and then the last lap I had I handed it off for just a couple minutes just to shake out my arm. Um, but I did... Two gels every lap just to keep my, in between aid stations, just to keep my calorie boost up, uh, not to drop, not to ever feel bad. Um, those got tiresome after hours and hours, but I just made sure that no matter what, I just got a gel down. Um, I would do either the bar, half of a bar. I, I like to use these bars called Bobo bars. Um, they're Bobo oat bars. I love them. Um, organic, um, just good quality product, um, or the waffle, and I would switch up between the two. Um, but my main goal was to make sure that I never went more than a half an hour with either without having some kind of calorie intake. Um, and it could just be a bite of a bar, a swig of some tailwind, a gel, something. 
Um, I just knew that if I did that from the beginning, that I would never get behind the gun and be trying to dig out of some deficit that I've created. So uh, I did that. I stayed really diligent about my nutrition. Um, as I said, I stayed. After about the third lap, I started really getting tired of sweet, which was expected, um, and I planned for that. So when I came into the aid stations, I would grab, um, they had boiled potatoes um, with a little side dish of like salt. So I would take three or four or five, depending on maybe sometimes even seven little potatoes, and I'd pop those in my mouth with some salt. And then they started later, probably after at mile 50 or so, they started having soups. Uh, I'm a vegetarian too, so um, I didn't want any of the hot dogs, hamburgers, chicken, and any of that stuff they had grilled. So uh, they had a potato soup that was just fantastic for me. It, was, it doesn't sound good when I say it now, but it was cream of potato. And so I'd ask them to put it in a cup, and then they would throw like two ice cubes in it. I'd stir it up so I could cool it down just a touch. And then I would just get it in me as quick as possible, you know, just so I didn't wait till like, oh, this doesn't taste good anymore. i just get it in me. Um, and I did that at almost every aid station coming back through. Um, at the home base uh, aid stations, they had two big aid stations, and they had some water and gel um, stops um, that were unmanned that were just there. Um, but the two big A stations were unbelievable. Everything you could ever think of. Hot dogs, hamburgers, grilled cheese, quesadillas, um, grilled chicken. Uh, and then they had every kind of sweet and salty snack you could imagine. So, and that was both of them were like that. So when I'd come back through, I would I would switch it up. And the first couple, I had like a, a half a grilled cheese sandwich, just something different and warm. And then they switched that to quesadillas. So I'd have just a small little wedge of a quesadilla, two or, two or three of those. Um, just for something other than potatoes and sweet, which just was like, I can't describe to you. And if you've done these races or done any kind of long endurance, like you have a grilled cheese or a, gr a piece of a grilled cheese and it's the best thing you've ever eaten. Um, so that was I, when I would have the quesadilla for the first time. I was like, this is the best thing I've ever eaten. Um, but with all that said, I really stuck to a plan where it was just don't go too long without anything to eat. Make sure you're not just nibbling, that you're actually getting some quality in you. Uh, and make sure that whatever you're eating tastes good to you. And regardless if it does, you've got to get calories in you. That was the biggest thing I was going in, going into this race that I knew I needed to do. So that's my, that's my nutrition. Three, number three on the topics would be execution. So I'm not going to go into a ton of details because one, the video is already getting long enough. And two, um, it's not that important. But what I, what I did is I had a plan going into this. I had a coach that I talked with about, you know, pace and what should I do? And ultimately, we kind of sat down and decided that I wanted to run the laps per time and not look at my watch for pace, just look at my watch like how quick I'm actually running each lap because I was easier to do, easier to do the math, especially when you get into the late, late stages of this race. I can look at like, oh, I ran that lap at this and I, ran, I need to run this lap at that. So I started out, my plan was to run each lap in sub two hours and 30 minutes, which is not a fast pace. I can run faster than that, but if a long day... Uh, I needed to execute it well. Well, the first lap I came in at 208, which is way too fast, almost 22 minutes, 22 minutes, 23 minutes faster than I wanted to run. Um, my girlfriend was there and she reminded me really quickly that uh, that was too fast. And if I wanted to make th this race, one, finish it, or two, do my goal, um, that I had to slow down. And so leaving out of the aid station, I, I heeded that warning. And I, next time I came in, when two hours and I think 40 minutes, for that lap, which equaled out to about what I wanted to be between the two. Um, so that was at mile 25, leaving out of there. I came back in the next lap. I had picked up a runner, of a guy named Jay out of Cary, North Carolina. Phenomenal runner, 305 marathon guy, 308 marathon guy, somewhere in there. So a strong runner. And we both wanted to, our ultimate goal was to go under 24 hours. Uh, I actually hung with him for um, the next three laps so from mile 12 and a half till mile 50 um, we pretty much stayed together other than little bits of time where we would lose each other at the transition or the headquarters um, but we didn't have always kind of meeting back up somewhere um, and we both just kept each other accountable i think my lap splits i'll just do those all right now were 208 240 um, 250 something 253 i think i did the next one um, my lap four was right around three hours. Then I picked up a pacer. We came in at two, three hours. We came in at 240 something. Then we came in at three, 258, which all said and done, that takes me through lap seven. And my ultimate goal was to have enough time banked in that lap, no matter what happened between mile 87 and a half and 100, that I'd be okay. So coming into that last lap, 
uh, I had four hours and 40 minutes to finish that lap and still go under 24 hours, which was my ultimate goal, which was my great day. Um, so I always have a race where it's a great day, a good day, and a finish day. Um, and any day is good if you finish. But, you know, I have those goals, and I try to have my athletes set those goals and, um, you know, execute them. And so if you either have a great day, good day, or finish day. Um, so uh, the, the next three laps, me and Jay um, ran – consistently I you know I just I kind of we both kind of made each other accountable um we weren't running any pace we were I was my goal was I, I from the beginning I walked as many hills as I need to um and obviously those got a little bit more where I had to rather than wanted that rather than needed rather than um wanted to but I just walked the hills and as soon as I could get to a flat area or a downhill area I ran um and if I could had enough energy going up some of this the less um, punchy hills, I'd run those as well. So, um, all in all, like had very good splits. I was very happy with that. The backside of that course, which I described earlier, was a little. Um, I actually enjoyed it more. You couldn't see as much. It wasn't quite as wide. It wasn't as flat and boring. Um, so um, I enjoyed I enjoyed the back section a little more. Um, sorry, need a little sip. Um, and uh, just, you know, all in all, the course, my execution of it, I felt very happy with. Um, I was able to run the last lap. My last split was 3.30, which is where I really kind of had fallen apart. So um, I, I'm, I'm happy with that as well. I was able to, I actually was able to run about the same amount of distance. It just had slowed down a lot. Um, I was, my, I'll be, you know, I'm, I'll say for this, like I literally, other than around the 50K mark, um, I felt fantastic um, for this race. And I don't know if that was nutrition or a good taper or um, being trained um, with a busy schedule like I have. Um, it was, uh, it, I just, I don't know, it felt great. I think I was just having fun, you know. I was just smiling. And if you, I look at all my race photos and I was smiling in all of them. Um, it's a 50K mark. For some reason, it was during, I think it was during the out and back section on, would have been, no, it would have been kind of the backside on lap three, I guess, somewhere in there. Anyway, it was around the 50K mark. I remember looking at my watch and I was at like 30 miles and I started thinking to myself, like, how am I going to finish this thing? Like, I just didn't feel 100%. Um, nothing was really achy. I think it was more my head and um, just the daunting thinking about, oh my God, I still got 70 more miles to go or 68 miles or whatever it was. I just kind of was, it, it really kind of overwhelmed me a little bit, and I, I, I just wasn't feeling 100%. It didn't last long, and I couldn't, if I tried to remember back how long it actually lasted, it didn't last a terribly long time. So I'm grateful for that, and I'm extremely grateful for my crew, um, which I'll name here in a minute, um, my pacers, which I'll name when I name my crew, and, um, and the fact that, you know, the ability to block out or not feel or whatever the pain of running 100 miles uh, until about mile 93. And I'll be honest, at mile 93, I was on the back section. I was bringing it home. It was still dark. It had been dark for a long time. And um, I, I just started to hurt. I couldn't disassociate myself with the pain anymore. I had somehow managed to do that for a while. Like I started to feel like my legs weren't 100%. They weren't feeling great. But I was able to not concentrate on it and not just think about that. Um, typically during a race, when you start to hurt, you just dwell on that. Oh, I'm hurting and this hurts and my knee doesn't feel right and my quads are killed. For some reason, I was able to just kind of remove myself from that pain for a really long time. And about mile 93, um, which sounds crazy, but about mile 93, I just couldn't block it away. I couldn't unconcentrate on it. That's all I could think about was how bad it hurt. Um, so... Um, those last seven miles were pretty painful, um, and uh, but you know I got through it and I did my goal. My I finish time was twenty two hours and thirty seven minutes, so I was an hour and forty two minutes faster than I thought I could ever do. So I'm really excited with that. Uh, I'm excited. Um, I got what I was ultimately going for, which was the Umstead one hundred belt buckle, the under sub twenty four um, belt buckle. So. Uh, I like the fact that it's it's actually a good size belt buckle. It's not an obnoxious belt buckle. Um, and it's silver. It's hard to tell that in here. And the other one was a finisher belt buckle, 
if you went under 30 hours, it said finisher on it. Um, but that was what I wanted ultimately. Um, and so I'm thrilled to death with that. Um, and my crew, uh, first my girlfriend, Marla, she was there. She supported me through all the training. She supported me through everything. Um, all the aches and pains, listening to me whine. She was there for every aid station with a big smile, pictures. Um, just a big supporter of the whole event and, and my craziness. Um, to my other crew, Nick, thanks for coming out. Uh, Beth was great. She did photographs. You guys were, were fantastic. To my two pacers that came out, uh, Steven ran laps five and six with me and took a break. And then Patrick, another good friend of mine, ran lap seven with me. Um, and then P Steven jumped back on to help me finish for lap eight. Um, they were fantastic, great pacers, just positive, knew what I needed without me knowing what I needed. Um, so it was just fantastic. All in all, I would do this race again. Uh, I probably will do this race again if I can get in. Uh, I had fun. It's close. Um, well supported race. Um, it's hard to think that I even want to do another 100. But anyway, um, now a shameless plug. If you guys any out there watching this and don't think you can do it, whether it's your first 5K or your Ironman um, or uh, a 50K or 50 miler or 100 miler, um, just send me a private message um, at w o l coach brian at gmail.com. Um, I would love to talk chat with you. Um, thanks for all the support for everybody. And thanks for watching my video. That was a really long video, but 100 miles is kind of hard to recap in a short period of time. So thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you on the next video. Oh, by the way, I'm going to do two more videos. One I'm going to do where I discuss my training leading up to this, how I fit in the hours, the mileage, all that stuff. And then uh, two, I'm going to talk about recovery, how I'm going to recover after running 100 miles um, without... I'm um, going crazy. So stay tuned for those videos. Have a great day.